I'm reading from Acts 6, verses 1 through 7. So if you'd like to follow along in your Bibles, uh, Acts 6, verses 1 through 7. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebrew Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles, who prayed and laid hands upon them. So the word of the God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. The word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Thank you, Diana. I was uh, especially excited to have uh, you read it. Just represent the deacons here because I think our passage has some unique tie-ins to the kind of the service, the ministry of the deacons. Uh, I'm going to say a quick prayer and then we're going to jump in. Heavenly Father, thank you for this this time together. Pray that you'd speak me, uh, speak to me through me, uh, through the camera, uh, into the homes and the hearts of the people that are listening. Lord, would I be an encouragement uh, to our church body this morning, Lord? Uh, we, we sense your presence uh, among us. We need your Holy Spirit here, Lord. Uh, we want to hear your word and put it into practice in our lives. And so we pray that you would help us do that. Help us to believe in Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So Monica and I have a saying in our home, and it's the, the title of today's sermon. It's teamwork makes the dream work. Uh, teamwork makes the the dream work. We love saying this in our home. Uh, it's not something that we created, uh, but it's something that we like to say. So for example, like when Monica is cooking dinner and I am playing in the living room with Elijah, well, teamwork makes the dream work. Or after dinner, when Monica is, is getting Elijah ready for bed and I'm doing the dishes, we say teamwork makes the dream work. Or like when Monica is scrubbing the floor and I'm downstairs playing video games, teamwork makes the dream work. I'm just kidding. Uh, but we like this catchphrase, teamwork makes the dream work. It's fun and it helps us kind of get in sync and just appreciate one another that we're working together well. It's short, it's catchy, and it has a good message that when we work together, good things happen. Now, I'd like to think that if the apostles, the 12 disciples, had a catchphrase for uh, today's passage for uh, kind of working with the church, they would at least appreciate, maybe they wouldn't say it, but they might appreciate teamwork makes the dream work. Teamwork makes the dream work. See, at the, the start of the early church, at the very beginning of the ministry, the apostles, uh, these, these 12 disciples that followed Jesus, uh, they are experiencing a challenge. They're, they're facing an obstacle in the, the life of the church. Because there are some women in the church, some older widows, uh, that are believers that are being neglected in the distribution of the food. So verse 1 says this, In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, so there's more and more believers, uh, the Hellenistic Jew Jews among them complained about the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. See, at that time, like today, uh, Jewish people lived in and around Jerusalem. And Judah, but they also lived in other parts of the world, uh, like in Greece or just Greek Greek speaking areas of the ancient world. Uh, but as I was reading and exploring uh, this this passage in the background, I discovered that uh, some of these families that lived in other parts of the world, in the Greek speaking parts of the world, as they got older and perhaps uh, older in age and, and near retirement or death, they would actually move back to Jerusalem. Just like, uh, you know, people move to uh, like Florida or some other place, like a nice warm place for retirement. Well, they would move back to Jerusalem so that they could be closer to Jerusalem when they died and be buried there. And so there, this created a bunch of widows in that area uh, because their, their husbands would typically die first and then they would be left in that area. 
Now, these, uh, these Greek-speaking widows would become believers, right? At least some of them would put their faith in Christ Jesus, and they joined this new community. But this new community of believers is mostly made up of Jewish believers, Hebraic believers, uh, believers uh, people who spoke Semitic languages like Hebrew and Arabic. Arabic. And, and so there's these people that have kind of embraced Greek culture but are still Jewish, and then there's these people that... Uh, are are uh, are Jewish, but have embraced Hebrew culture, and they're trying to come together and form one new community. And uh, what happens is the Greek-speaking widows uh, they are getting left out. Now, maybe that's intentional because uh, maybe those that are serving are are playing favoritism, and they're just kind of giving food to the uh, Hebrew uh, widows, or maybe they're not. Maybe it's just an accident. Maybe there are so many of them that they're having trouble uh, kind of managing uh, what's going on, but it creates this sort of tension. And it's actually a tension that we see in the rest of the New, New Testament. It's, I, it's almost an introduction to the tension between uh, Jews and Gentiles, between Jewish people and non-Jewish people, the Greek people. And so the question is, how are the, how are the disciples, how are the apostles going to make it work? What are they going to do to kind of navigate this difficult situation? Now, as a church today, we don't particularly face that challenge, right? We, we don't have um, this daily distribution of food to our widows, and, uh, and we, we just don't have to navigate that. But there are a lot of uh, responsibilities and duties and tasks that we as a church have to do. Uh, for example, uh, who's in charge of running the church? Who's in charge of running the ministries? Who's in charge of uh, the building and the money and who, who leads the youth ministry or the children's ministry or the community groups or the Christian education hour? Uh, when we get money, what do we do with the money? Like, where does our budget come from? And, uh, and when we hear about a need in our church or in our wider Westford community, who does that go to and who helps navigate that need? And uh, aren't we supposed to be doing discipleship and evangelism? And uh, who's kind of the primary voice on those things? And so you see, there's a lot of things that a church can do and we can very quickly become overwhelmed and just kind of um, uh, overwhelmed and, and, and burdened and, uh, and even confused as we face all of these challenges, challenges and responsibilities. Now, these responsibilities are good things, but we need to make sure that we're doing the right things, that, that the right people are filling the right roles. And so this kind of brings us back to our passage because it shows us how certain people should focus on certain things and other people should focus on other things. That teamwork, when these kind of two focuses come together, can actually make the vision work, to make the, the dream work. Teamwork makes the dream work. And it allows us to do those things that really matter most. Love God, love each other, and love those around us. And so first today I want to talk about teamwork. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about like what that looks like in this Acts passage and what that can look like in our lives and our ministry as a church. And then I want to talk about the dream. I want to talk about what we're trying to achieve, what we're trying to accomplish. And so first, let's talk about teamwork. Now, I believe that teamwork here in our passage, we see that it is based on gifting and calling. Based on gifting and calling. See, the apostles, the twelve, they solve the problem of the Greek-speaking widows and their need. Uh, through recognizing gifting and calling and uh, by, by raising others up to help them. Now, the leaders of the church, the, uh, the disciples, the apostles, they're specifically called and gifted by God uh, with certain ab abilities, talents, and passions. But it's not just the leaders of the church who are, who are given these gifts and talents and passions and called by God. It's everyone in the church. But God does set aside the the leaders, the apostles in this early church setting, and I believe uh, our elders and some of our leadership in today's church setting uh, for the ministries of teaching, of sharing God's word, of praying, uh, and empowering others, kind of raising others up. And we see this in today's passage in Acts 2, uh, Acts 6, verses 2 through 4. Let me read those verses. So the twelve, so these are the apostles, they gathered all the disciples together, so this is all the followers and, and, and themselves, and it said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men among you from who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. 
we will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now we at Cornerstone, we don't have apostles. Right? The apostles, I think you can have the gift of apostleship still today where you're like uniquely sent to a culture or a community to share God's word. But we do have church leaders known as elders, right? Elders are shepherds, uh, pastor, I'm an elder, John Rawls, Mark Pender, we are your current elders, and we've had others, Terry and Andy. And, and here we find kind of that group of people, those that are over the beginning church, saying, you know, we can't neglect God's word to wait on tables. Uh, and so I think we're going to see that elders are called to preach, pray, and commission. Elders preach, pray, and commission. Now, it's not that helping serve tables is a bad thing. Help and serve tables is a good thing. These widows need to be cared for. It is part of like their, their Christian duty, their, their gospel love, their, their gospel duty as they follow Christ. But it does say that, you know, this isn't their job, the, the apostles' job. Instead, they need to give their attention to something else, to prayer and the ministry of the word. And this actually ties into that kind of big picture that Jesus gave the 12 before he ascended into heaven. If you remember back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, Jesus has a special task for his church leaders, for his disciples. He wants them to take the gospel to the ends of the earth throughout the ancient world. And so we're still a part of that. We're still taking that message of Jesus, the, 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 the Lamb of God who died and laid down his life for the sins of the world, but then rose again in victory over sin and death so that whoever repents of their sins and believes in him will receive eternal life, this gospel message, which is so important. Like, they're to take that message and then teach about Jesus to the entire ancient world. They're to be witnesses of Jesus. That means they're to bear testimony that Jesus is alive. <laughs> they saw him rise from the grave, and they're supposed to tell everyone. And so we're actually joining in that mission today as we share the gospel to the ends of the earth, right? We're, we're actually in the ends of the earth, right? We're in Westford. We're in Chelmsford, Littleton, Acton. And we're continuing to share the gospel to the ends of the earth, just like we saw with that ministry moment with Thierry uh, in France. And then when we go to Haiti or when we, uh, when we help the Veer Institute with kind of the Boston ministry. See, we're, we're taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth as well. And so they want to fulfill this mission that Jesus has given them. And when they, when the apostles, when the leaders focus on what Jesus has given them to do, that mission that Jesus has given them to do, the church actually grows. So by them obeying Jesus, doing what he's called them to do, the church grows and multiplies. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and 47 say this, They, so this is the first church community, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayer, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So I skipped a middle chunk in there that talks about, you know, they were loving each other in community, they were giving to each other sacrificially, they were going to the temple, they were praising God. They were doing all these things, and their church was growing. But it started with simply knowing God's word, studying it, obeying it, and putting it into practice in their daily lives. And this witness was not just a kind of cloistered silent witness among themselves, they were actually going to the temple and, and preaching and, and sharing the gospel with those that didn't know Christ. They were evangelizing, evangelizing God's grace. And so uh, we see them uh, sharing the gospel. Acts 5, chapter 42 says, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So they were really taking the time to, to work through what the Bible has to say with their neighbors, with the people that they worked alongside, with the people that they knew and that they served. And so this is an amazing, uh, amazing example of something that we might call like frontline evangelism as they were just out there sharing the gospel. And we see this among the, the, the 12 first and foremost among the apostles as they were preaching the gospel uh, in and throughout uh, Jerusalem. And so as we take this lesson and kind of apply it to our own lives, like I believe God does call the leaders of Cornerstone to first give themselves to, to, to prayer, to the ministry of the word, and, and to, to raising others up. And, and so we see this, that God has gifted and called the elders in a certain way to preach, pray, 
and commission. Now, when we're allowed to kind of focus on the gifts that God has given us, uh, that also encourages others to focus on the gifts that God has given them. I uh, see we want everyone to be operating and to be functioning in the way God has gifted you. In other ways, the, the talents, the abilities, the passions God has given you, and also the calling, the way God has, has said, I want you to serve him. Because when we're all doing what God has gifted and called us to do, we're all gonna, we're gonna work together. Uh, and sometimes we have to like be extra intentional about working together, but teamwork makes the dream work, right? Uh, and so we find here the early el uh, elders, the kind of the, the early church leaders, they're teaching, preaching, evangelizing, and uh, things are happening. Good things are happening. And I see that in our, our church as well. When, when we're all focusing on those things God has gifted us to, I see good things happening. Uh, for example, uh, while we've been away, so we haven't been able to go to the church, but our buildings and grounds crew has been able to go to our church and uh, and uh, Bruce has smashed a hole in the basement wall while we've been away. So you can see this kind of lovely picture here uh, uh, in the center of the screen. Look at what Bruce has done. And then he, there's a pile outside, which is fun. If you want to help him get rid of that, let him know. Uh, and then, uh, and then you can see what he's, what he's, where he's at right now, like this beautiful door that he's put together and how our children's ministry is going to be uh, able to use that. So we thank Bruce for that, but uh, this is also just an example of like, if, if you guys had asked me to do that, let's imagine if you would call me and say, Jonathan, we really want you to put a new uh, door in the basement wall. Like I probably would have electrocuted myself about five minutes into it as I, as I hit a socket. Uh, but if I hadn't done that, if I'd gotten past that, it probably would have taken me like a year to do that. But see, Bruce is almost done. I know he's been working really hard and put a lot of work into it, but he's making a lot of progress. And how about all the other ways that people have been gifted in Cornerstone? I know many of you are making masks or have made masks in the past and you've given them out to church people or um, you're working for someone or you've given out to family members. And if I were to make those masks, like uh, I don't think it would help much. Uh, it, would, it would be very simple. It'd be like some twine and uh, like a paper towel on your face. Like you would not look good when you went to Market Basket or to the store to go shopping. Uh, you know, and there's other people who have been like, making meals, uh, and yet there are some people who have been doing kind of a teaching ministry, right? Like I was really encouraged this morning by listening to, to Terry as he led our Christian education hour from nine to 10. Like God has clearly gifted him in the ministry of the word. And, and when he's using that gifting, it's encouraging those of us that are logging in, those are of us that are, that are listening. Uh, and so uh, that's an encouragement to benefit from the gifting of others. Like if someone wants to make you a meal, let them. Uh, if someone uh, wants to, to teach you something and has that gifting, will show up and be a part of that, uh, that time to, to learn. Elders preach, pray, and commission, and teamwork kind of makes the dream work. Now, uh, so that's kind of the preaching part. And I would say that not every elder has to preach, but I do think every elder has to be in, involved in the teaching ministry of the church, whether that's preaching or teaching and youth, adults, children. Uh, I do think that has to be a part of the role of an elder. Now, I want to talk a little bit about prayer because we don't typically think of prayer as hard work, but it is. Prayer takes time to really go through the needs of the church body and to uh, pray for them. Uh, we just sent out that church directory, and that's something that uh, myself, the elders, need to be praying for. And I have been trying to pray uh, for all of you uh, recently uh, through that church directory. But I can think of times in my own life where I, I felt like the Lord was leading us as a church one direction, and I tried a few things, and none of those things seemed to work. Like, I was like, hmm, uh, that didn't seem to work. In fact, maybe that caused more problems. And then finally, when I just kind of laid it down before the Lord, and I said, I'm going to just pray about this and just give it to you, Lord. Uh, that's when the Lord opened the door and we, we went forward that direction as a church body. And uh, that's just like in ministry as a church, but you can probably think about that in your own life. And you're like, man, I really wanted to get this new job. Or I wanted to move to this new area. Uh, and, and I tried everything, right? I tried all the job boards or I tried, um, uh, you know, I tried contacting my family members about what I wanted them to do and nothing would work. And so I just stood back and I prayed about it and God moved. And I know we have these stories. I have these stories. You have these stories. Uh, and that takes time. That takes faith. That takes patience to kind of set aside that time and say, Lord, I need, to, I need to come before you and pray. And we need you to move in the life of the church. And that's why when it comes to knowing even like the right path to, 
to coming back to ministry at Cornerstone, when we're going to start worshiping together as a church body. Like we need to pray about that. The leadership needs to pray about that. I know when the elders and deacons meet tomorrow night through the lovely technology of Zoom, we're going to pray about that. And we're going to spend some time like praying for the needs of our church and when the Lord would have us get back together and and, and using wisdom and, and common sense as well. But we can all be praying about things like that. Uh, maybe you've heard the catchphrase, uh, couples that pray together, stay together. I'm really like digging the, the catchphrases tonight. Couples that pray together, stay together. Well, I think churches that pray together, stay together. Churches that pray together, work well together. So teamwork makes the dream work, but you have to cover that, that, that teamwork with prayer. And our elders, myself included, are to lead by example in that area. And, uh, the Lord puts it on your heart to help with our prayer network, please let me know. So I also want to talk about, so elders preach, pray, and commission. I want to talk about that commission component, but I want to talk about it kind of through the lens of what the deacons do, because the deacons care for the needs of the church body. So the apostles, the, the 12, uh, they choose seven. Uh, I don't know why they chose seven, perhaps just because it was like a complete number. One for each day of the week, maybe. Uh, they choose seven to care for these Hellenistic widows. Verses 3 and 5 and 6 say this. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. See, the twelve don't just choose people who are able to meet the need. They don't just choose, like, the first people that come in off the street. They ask the community, who would you choose? And then, uh, and then the community says, well, we, we choose these people, and we're going to choose people who are full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, th so these are the elders, the apostles, they're laying this down. They're saying, you need to choose people who are full of the Spirit and wisdom. Uh, and then they allow the community to kind of choose and raise up these other people who then they commission. That means they, they lay their hands upon them, they, they set them aside, they give them their authority, and they say, go for it. Do it. We as your leaders are trusting you. Verses 5 and 6 tells us a little bit about who was chosen. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So they're commissioning these people, but I want you to notice something about them. They all have Greek names, right? And one even is a convert to Judaism, who uh, is, a, is a proselyte. So that means he wasn't born Jewish, but became kind of a Jewish Christian believer. Uh, but all these people are, are Hellenists. They're Greek-speaking uh, Jews. And so like, they have clearly been gifted, right? They've been gifted. God has said, I'm going to raise these people up. I'm going to give them lives that forms them, that shapes them, so that one day they can serve me in this way. And then he calls them. The apostles lay their hands on them and say, God calls you. We choose you. The church body has chosen you. Uh, and so we see like this beautiful gifting and calling coming together with kind of the formal uh, commissioning of the church. Maybe you're wondering like, where am I gifted? Like, what has God called me to? Well, if you're gifted uh, in an area, like if you have a talent or ability in a certain area and it it could be, uh, you know, something we find in the scripture or even something that we don't hear mentioned in the scripture that you're like good at. Uh, well, then look at that and, and examine it in your own life. Maybe ask someone in the church and, and, and try to help out. Offer your, these gifts to a church body, to the church body and say, hey, I can help out in this way. And then whether or not you're formally called is when like people in the church recognize, oh, yeah, you are good at that. We want you to serve and be a part of our church community in that way. Please use that gifting to grow God's church. And so there's these, like, I'm gifted, God, God raises people up, and then he calls them to, to serve the church body together. And so we see deacons kind of uh, going through that process first here. And I, and I don't know if these are exactly deacons in this passage, but as we look at our own church, we see uh, kind of this pattern of apostles and these servant-hearted people reflected in the offices of elders and deacons here at Cornerstone. Uh, and our deacons here also take care of like the physical and material needs of the church body. Uh, they, they take care of finances and buildings and, uh, and the people needs, right? They're the ones who are making the meals so that I don't show up with a bunch of scrambled eggs and a peanut butter and jelly. Like they're making good meals, nutritious meals. 
uh, and so we're grateful uh, for them. I, uh, right after I, I mentioned this painting, Monica did point out to me that there is a little bit of a parallel uh, with uh, this, uh, the sailboat, right? This is a picture of a sailboat and it's pretty tough, I imagine. I've never been a sailor, but it's pretty tough to, to sail a boat by yourself. Like it's much easier to sail a boat with a team where different people have different roles, right? Uh, steering the ship, uh, uh, taking care of the sail, um, uh, working together. And so we see here different roles, like different kind of sailors sailing this, this ship, uh, heading a direction, heading the, let, letting the Holy Spirit lead them, right? The Holy Spirit is kind of blowing the wind in their sails and pushing them forward, but they're using their gifts, they're using their talents, their abilities in different stations throughout this boat to kind of direct it forward and to, and to work together and to go where the Holy Spirit wants them to go. And I think that's a beautiful picture, uh, a beautiful picture of what God wants us to do. So elders preach, pray, and commission. Deacons care for the needs of the church body. But there's not just elders in a church, and there's not just deacons in a church. And I've already been hinting at this, and I've already been talking about it. But every member of the church body is gifted and called. Every member. And so whether you're an adult, a kid, a teenager, every member is gifted and called uh, to be a part of this church body. And I do want to read that passage that Monica was directing us to this morning as part of the children's moment. It's the Apostle Paul, who's, who's going to become kind of one of the leaders of the church here soon. Uh, he talks about the church, the church body, right, and its different parts and how every part is gifted in a different way. Verse 8 says, To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still another, to the interpretation of tongues. Verse 12. Just as one body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So the Bible uses the illustration of a body, right? That we have different parts. We have hair and ears and eyes and mouths and how they do different things. That they're unique and they're different. And they each have their gift, their ability that they give to the complete body as a whole. Paul says that's just like a church, right? We're distinct. We're unique. We're different. And yet we come together, we work together, and we do something that none of us could do on our own. We worship and we glorify God in a special and unique way. Now I was trying to find an illustration of teamwork uh, this week and I ran into the illustration of Steve Jobs. Now you may know that Steve Jobs founded Apple Computers. Or, uh, I'm live streaming my service on an Apple iPhone right now. Uh, and uh, so he, he, he created a lot of technology and in 1986 Steve Jobs purchased Pixar uh, and it went on to create films like Toy Story, Monsters Inc., Finding Nemo, Cars, all those great movies up and I found an article that kind of taught me about uh, when they moved campuses. So they bought this, uh, this campus in 2000 and they relocated to a Del Monte canning factory. And the original plan called for three different buildings, right? So they were gonna have this big campus, three different buildings. They were gonna have offices for computer scientists. They were gonna have offices for animators and they were gonna have offices for the executives, right? And Steve Jobs, when he saw that plan, he scraped it. He said, that's not a good idea. I want you to move them all together. I'm going to create a, zinc, a single vast space. I know there's other like little offices around, but I'm going to create a single vast space called the atrium at its center. And here's a, a quote from Ed Catmull, the president of Pixar. He says, the philosophy behind the design is that it's good to put the most important function at the heart of the building. Well, what's our most important function? It's the interaction of our employees. That's why Steve put a big empty space there. He wanted to create an open area for people to always be talking to each other. Uh, and, and for Jobs, how he did this is he created this space for Pixar and he wanted them to work together and collaborate. So he put everything there. He put, uh, he put mailboxes, he put cafeterias, he put uh, meeting rooms, uh, cafeteria, the coffee bar, the gift shop. I don't know if we have a picture of that or if you already put that picture up, but this is a picture of the atrium. And, uh, and this became a place where like people would they would go, they would gather, and they'd like make eye contact, and they'd see each other across the room. They'd come together, they'd form ideas, and then like the magic of Pixar animation would happen. 
And I just think that is such an interesting example of what kind of we already have in the church. See, as the church, we already have a time where we weekly, obviously right now we're during this uh, COVID pandemic, uh, so we're a little separated, we're a little isolated, but normally we have this time when we come together every week to focus on God, to make eye contact, to, to worship God and to love each other. And we're coming together with all of these gifts and all these abilities and, uh, and we're learning about God and we're, we're, we're interacting with each other. And, and just like uh, they could have separated their computer scientists and their animators and their executives, like we can, we can uh, separate ourselves where it's like all the people that kind of love children over here and all the people that love youth over there. And in some ways we do this, right? Because we have different teams, but ultimately we want to come back together. We want to, uh, we want to see what God can do through us together as a church body. And that's one of the reasons even to join us at our annual meeting on May 31st so that we can talk about how we as a church can continue to function as a body. We're going to have an open Q and A in that meeting. So you can say, Hey, this is how I'd like to see us work, or here's an idea or, or, or whatever uh, along those lines. But when we come together as a church using our different gifts and abilities and ways that God has given us, we can make like pieces of art, we can make music and we can teach, we can evangelize, we can serve, we can care for the needy, we can love one another, we can be the church body and it is beautiful. Every member of the church has a gifting and a calling uh, and that's how together teamwork makes the dream work. Of course DreamWorks is a different studio so teamwork makes Pixar work I guess in our illustration. Now, maybe you're not called to preaching, praying, and commissioning, but you are called to something else. Well, there, like I read this gifting, this is just one example of gifts in the New Testament, but there are like five different sections in the New Testament that list gifts, gifts that God has given us to serve each other, to serve him, to serve the church. And that means I think those gifts are representative. I mean, I think there are gifts that aren't even mentioned in the Bible that we can use to bless the church body, right? They don't talk about the gift of, of, of like leading a live stream <laughs> through the gift of technology. Uh, and yet uh, John is doing that right now as he's helping me broadcast this. That's a gifting, right? Uh, and so there are lots of different ways that we can gift, uh, use our gifts and, and serve each other. Maybe you're an incredibly friendly person. And when we come back together as a church body, that means like you can join the greeters and you can be welcoming people and, and just, uh, you know, being connecting with newcomers. But what about this time? Well, it's going to look a little different during this time of being apart. We sent out the church directory. Maybe you as a friendly person can call people in the church directory and just check in on them, see how they're doing. How about, uh, uh, you know, people that are in need? You can make meals for people that are homebound. Uh, and you can do that now or at other times. We've had people show up and give us meals. Like there are, are so different, it's like maybe you're gifted in like cutting hair. <laughs> well, you're going to be needed. Like you can already tell that I, I need you. I know I've, I've seen Bernie, like Bernie needs you. Like together we need you so badly. And uh, we're going to have to figure out when we can do that. Or maybe you're gifted in like writing encouragement cards. I know someone is writing out encouragement cards to the entire, entire church. Like that's amazing. That's beautiful. Uh, that's a way that this person's using their gifting in this time. And so if you're not sure where you fit in, just reach out, let me know, and I'll try to help you connect. Because I believe that one of my giftings is connection. It's helping people connect, and it's, and it's bringing uh, kind of those relationships together. Uh, and so I want to help you, especially if you're new, and get connected into the church body. Teamwork makes the dream work. So I've talked about team, and now I want to talk about the dream. Because I think the dream is the vision God gives us to fulfill the mission that Christ has given us. So there's like this unique vision that God gives us, and it's really just fulfilling Jesus's mission to, to share the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. What better way to accomplish this than through teamwork? We see in verse 7, this happened. So the word of God spreads. So this is kind of the result of them doing this teamwork, elders, deacons, congregation, focusing on the different things. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So I, I, I read a book on prayer and kind of this passage called Old Paths, New Power that said this about the high priests coming to faith. It said, these Jewish priests were hardliners, tough opponents of the gospel. The network of religious rivals who conspired to crucify Christ was now losing a significant number of its own ranks to a transformation found in the life of the resurrected Jesus. 
It would be like a modern day salvation wave that engulfs some of the most notable atheists and critics of the faith in our day. Truly amazing, truly God, truly the way the gospel ought to be. So if we want to see the gospel grow in Westford uh, and in our communities, the solution isn't super difficult. Focus on the ways God has gifted you. So as elders and as leaders of the church, we need to focus on sharing, teaching, evangelizing God's word, uh, prayer, and, and helping raise others up, commissioning others to be a part of that. As deacons, they need to focus on the kind of the logistical and caring for the needs of the church body, like being those material managers that we so appreciate of them. And then everyone else is also gifted in outreach and music and worship and evangelism and service. And we need you to be a part of the church body. And together, when we work together, uh, we begin to function the way God intended, the way God had gifted us and the way God had calls us. And I think this is amazing uh, that teamwork really does make the dream work, <laughs> that we will see like people coming to Christ through this time when we, when we operate like God wants us to operate. Now, the dream of the 12 and the dream at Cornerstone is that everyone would come to know Christ. Like We want to see our community come to know Jesus. But this dream does not originate in our hearts. This dream originates in the very heart of God. Ephesians 1, 4 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So before time began, God had a dream. He dreamed of you and me, uh, and he dreamed of us knowing his son, Christ Jesus, and using our gifts and talents and abilities to love and to serve Jesus. And that's why Jesus, to accomplish God's dream, to accomplish his father's dream, laid down his life. Uh, so that you and I could exit the nightmare of our sins and come into the, the, the beautiful reality, the waking reality of God's grace. And see, this is why we need Jesus. And then this is why we follow Jesus every day but by using our gifts and talents, because we want to we wanna experience eternal life. The Bible says eternal life doesn't just start when we die. The eternal life is knowing Christ Jesus. And we know Jesus by believing in him, by repenting of our sins, but also by using our gifts and talents the way he intended. And see, it's as we recognize the grace that Jesus offers us that if we're using our gifts, our talents, and our abilities, and let's say you know we, we, we think we're gifted in one area, but we actually aren't, and we try something and we fail miserably. Well, we don't have to condemn ourselves. We don't have to feel guilty or frustrated or sad because Jesus loves us and he's forgiven us. Uh, and he he just he he knows us from the inside out, and he cares for us. Or on the other hand, if we if we try our gifts and we try our abilities and we succeed, and then cornerstone's like cornerstone takes off and it starts growing, and it's like wow, look at what I have done. Well, no, look at the ways God has gifted and called you. And so for the low, it raises you up, and it, 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 if you're if you're feeling shame or fear, like it, it takes away those things. But for the pride, it also takes away those things. Uh, that's what the gospel does. It, it, it gives us a right perspective on life and on uh, who God has made us to be, that he has gifted us, he has called us, and he has invited us to be a part of his team, the church. Jesus loves you. Teamwork makes the dream work. Let me pray.